Hello and good day ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure and honor being here speaking with you today. My name is Hamid Bakhtiar. I own and operate Carolina Compounding Pharmacy in North Carolina. Today we're going to talk about what is compounding pharmacy. Of course I'm a compounding pharmacist. How to write a prescription for a compound and how it can help benefit you, the provider and your patient. So what is compounding? I'll give you the brief practical information on the following slides. I have more technical and elaborate definitions, which I'll skip over, but you'll have them in your um, slides for reference. Essentially, when you take two or more medications or active ingredients, mix them together, dilute them, change the flavor, change the form, or the dosage, you are compounding. Any physician and any pharmacist does have the right to compound and with additional specific training it can be done um, very easily and it can be done in a very useful manner. Here's a more elaborate definition of compounding. And here's the National Association of Boards of Pharmacies definition of compounding. Here is the NADP's definition of manufacturing. So what are some of the similarities and differences between compounding and manufacturing? Well, uh, the similarity is that they both make medications. There are specific doses that are produced to help either cure or treat a condition for a patient. In manufacturing, however, the ultimate user, the patient, is unknown and the number of doses that can be manufactured due to economics and other uh, limiting factors are very limited. Um, in compounding, that's not the case. For instance, if you're manufacturing, say, amoxicillin 500, mill 500 milligram capsules, you make millions and you dispense them through the uh, uh, dispensing network that end up in pharmacies or some physicians' offices to be administered or dispensed to the um, patient. Whereas in compounding, you cannot do that ahead of time, at least in traditional definition of compounding. So your patient must be identified and you compound only to help take care of that one patient's specific needs. So is compounding a new thing in the US, in the world? Well, not really. Compounding was the pharmacy up until the 1900s. I found a couple of biblical references, references where they talk about anointing someone and uh, following a specific recipe to get to um, what they need. Up until uh, the past century, compounding was everything you had in medicine. You had druggists and in the world they were called chemists that would mix up different ingredients um, for medicine. Um, industrial revolution and advances in science and technology and machines sort of put an end to the, the making medication in the old ways. So everything wanted to become more streamlined and more economical, sensible, and that's how we got away from compounding. But now things are going back towards um, uh, compounding because we're now leaning towards more individualized medicine. We're understanding that the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work all the time. One question that I'm asked from time to time is that are compounded medications FDA approved? Well, the answer is no, they're not FDA approved because they do not go through that FDA new drug application or the abbreviated new drug application format. Those things cost millions of dollars and they do take a number of years and no compounding pharmacist I know has that kind of resource. Plus, that's not really the essence of compounding to get everything that you do approved through the FDA. That you, you will never take care of your patients. But um, from what we know of the millions and millions of doses of compounded medications that are dispensed only in this country every year, and the reports that come back, we do know that generally speaking, they're both safe and effective. Of course, things go wrong. Um, this is, after all, a part of medicine. And like any other profession, there are some people who should not be doing compounding, some bad apples that give a bad name to everybody else. But generally speaking, most things are, are safe and effective, and they're monitored very well by the prescriber and by the pharmacist, and things go, uh, go okay. 
So let's put things in perspective. Does that mean that um, something that is not FDA approved, it's not necessarily good or safe or effective? No. Please look at this list. On here we see things such as um, pergoric, such as oxycodone tablets, such as nitroglycerin sublingual tablets, thyroid tablets, um, potassium iodide oral solution, and the list goes on and on and on, protein phosphate, injection protein sulfate tablets. So not everything that we use, we use scientifically, we do understand the limitations, the application and the interactions, not everything is going to be FDA approved. It's nice to have those, but the reality is something different. So what does a compounding pharmacist do? The compounding pharmacist's role is to formulate um, that dose that is individualized to that particular patient. For somebody else or another patient, we'll formulate something different. It is truly individualized therapy. And we can get really deep in this. We can um, run drug-drug interactions. If the um, pharmacogenomic um, information is available, we can certainly design a drug, help design a drug, and in, in collaboration with the physician or the provider, we can manage, help manage the therapy better. It is truly custom-made medications. So what types of compounding pharmacies are out there? Well, there's plenty, from independent community pharmacies to hospital pharmacies, even some chain pharmacies, mail order, some specialty pharmacies, some pharmacies that do veterinary medicine only, some that do humans only, and some that do a combination of both. Nuclear pharmacy is also worth mentioning. So NCPA estimates that more than 70% of pharmacies in the country do engage in some type of, of compounding pharmacy. When you prescribe uh, triamcinolone mixed in eucerin, one-on-one, -on -one, or, or any other ratio. When you prescribe for uh, a magic mouthwash, that is an act of compounding. Even some chain pharmacies ha have uh, started compounding, but the sad thing is, is around me, they do it from 12 a.m. until 5 o'clock in the morning because that's the slowest time for the pharmacy to do that. Now, I don't know what kind of attention people usually have during those hours, but in it's something that, that, that does happen. So what can you do as a compounding pharmacist and who are the patients? So it's really important to have this early on in the conversation that compounders cannot, they're not allowed to duplicate a commercially available medicine. And although we might, we might disagree with certain aspects of this, for example, if a commercially available medicine is so expensive, then the patient cannot afford it, isn't that considered an impediment? Well, we can think that, we can feel that, however, that's not uh, the way um, the regulations are written. So we cannot compound something that's commercially available unless the patient has specific documented allergies to that. So compounding can help with limited dosage forms, strengths. When something is on manufacturer's um, discontinued list, or on a manufacturer shortage, even though it's a commercially available medicine, in those conditions we can compound them, but other times, other than I mentioned, uh, we cannot compound medications. Orphan drugs are other examples, veterinary compounding. Now for um, our four-legged friends and family members, we don't have as many medications as we have for humans. So certainly things can have to be compounded for them. A bird has different needs than a cat, than uh, a horse, than a human. So also um, there are special patient populations based on pharmacogenomics that do need things made differently. Hospice is another really good example of, of um, compounded medication arena. So what are some areas of practice for compounding pharmacy? Well, in the areas of autoimmune, pediatrics, geriatrics, hormone replacement therapy, this is a biggie, and even dental and dermatology in veterinary medicine, as I mentioned. Um, you have patients who are either lactose and gluten 
um, sensitive or allergic or intolerant, you have um, things to be administered through some kind of a tube. Uh, people on extremely low carbohydrate diets, those are the pain is another um, area where compounding can be extremely helpful and I think it is very underutilized. Pain is very, very individualized. So you wouldn't necessarily use a muscle relaxant on neuropathic pain and hope that it would go away. So you would need, you would need agents to help target um, the nerve or the nerve transmission of pain. And often you need more than one agent to do this. And those things are not commercially available in any combination form. Uh, of course, you would not treat, for example, um, uh, muscle pain the same way as you would do uh, fibromyalgia or uh, even post-surgical pain. So those are the arenas that a compounding pharmacist can, in collaboration with the provider, um, do patient a lot of good and reduce a lot of unnecessary side effects and even habit-forming medication. Bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is um, one of those areas that compounding pharmacy has come to shine over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, we take hormones that are identical in the molecular structure to what we have in our bodies and we compound them into whether an oral or topical form and sometimes injectable form. They can be alone or in, or in any combination that the prescriber would like them to be. What's the source of them? Typically there are two different sources. Number one, it's soy-based hormones and number two, it's Mexican wild yam based um, sources. There are some patients who believe it or not insist on having soy-based but in 15 years of practice I've had only one. However, everybody else wants to stay away from soy and they want to focus on a wild Mexican yam base. Now, some, there are some myths and misconceptions on the part of the patients and just to lay public on this. One is, well, if I get Mexican wild yam and cook it or steam it or fry it, I can get these hormones, right? I eat them and they go in my system and my body just knows what to convert and how to convert it and what uh, to convert it from. Well, that just isn't the case. And it brings us back to the, uh, to the topic of what is considered natural, what is bioidentical, and what is um, synthetic, which I'll discuss later in the presentation. So by using compounding and utilizing these bioidentical hormones the correct way, we can help reduce side effects. And um, with a robust program of, of again, um, collaborating, but collaboration between the physician and pharmacist and patient consultation, I think a lot of good can be done in this one arena. So one question that I'm asked is, hey doc, um, my doctor wrote for so-and-so, uh, but I don't want it to be synthetic, I want it to be natural. Is it bioidentical? I'm really confused. So. Natural is anything that has its roots in nature, for example, Mexican wild yam or soy. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best modality or is harmless. The venom of a cobra is also a very natural process. Um, a lot of the um, uh, harm creating bacteria and fungi are also very natural, so you can't get any more natural than that. What's, uh, is it synthetic? Synthetic does not mean that it's necessarily good or bad for you. So not everything synthetic is bad. Synthetic, it simply means it was synthesized in an organic chemistry laboratory somewhere. All the hormones we use in pharmacy these days, well, almost all of them, they're out of a, a synthetic process. They come from Mexican wild yam. They go from the Mexican wild yam. This compound is extracted. This um, compound is converted into that four-ring structure of cholesterol, which we all have in our bodies, all humans. And from that, they're further synthesized to become your progesterone, your testosterone, estradiol, estriol, DHEA, and so on. So just because it's synthetic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not bioidentical. It does not mean it's good. It does not mean it's bad. We just need to understand what that means. And bioidentical, by definition, is any molecule that is identical in chemical structure and in rotation 
to uh, what we have in our body. So those are important distinctions to make. So how do I write for compounded prescription medicine? I strongly, strongly encourage you to form collaborative relationships with your compounding pharmacists or pharmacists. It's very important that you're both on the same page because both of you are trying and doing your best to help take care of that patient. And a bit of communication can really go a long, long way. I mean, let's face it, we all study different things, we're expert at different things. So we come together to complete that triangle of physician, patient, and pharmacist relationship for the best possible therapeutic outcomes. So a compounded prescription is just like any other prescription you write. And if you have any doubt or you're unsure, call the compounding pharmacist. Hey, this is what I have. This is what I'm looking at. What do you think? My patient has been on, you know, biased um, 0 0.5 milligrams, 80, 20 in the past. The levels are not coming up. We're still having side effects. What do I do? What do you recommend? What do you recommend? You know, those types of conversations can help save everybody time and, uh, and, and resources, frankly. So if you're not sure of a, um, a milligram versus a percent or a milligram percent or a microgram, how do I dose this? Please contact the uh, compounding pharmacist. We're always available. We love doing this, this kind of work. We collaborate with you, the provider, to help take care of the patient. How is compounding pharmacy regulated? Hey, are you guys even, does anybody even look at you? Is it the wild west of medicine? Do you get to come to work and do whatever you want in any way you want it? Well, absolutely not. Compounding pharmacy, by the admission of attorneys who work in, in the field of healthcare, are the most regulated uh, sector of the healthcare industry. There are more regulations here than there are for physicians and hospitals. It is just amazing. And there is no shortage of regulating bodies. Well, you have the state's board of pharmacy that's on, 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 on top of every compounding pharmacy anywhere in the nation. So even if you have a pharmacy, for example, that's located halfway across the country in Arkansas or say in Washington state, when they ship anything into North Carolina, they must get a license from the North Carolina board of pharmacy. By that virtue, that means they're under the jurisdiction of North Carolina as well as their home state and vice versa for any compounding pharmacy in North Carolina. So that has licenses elsewhere. We have licenses in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida, which means we're subject to the laws, rules, and regulations of all three states, not just one. So uh, a few years back after the New England compounding pharmacy fiasco, a uh, 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 criminal fiasco, the FDA um, divided compounding pharmacies into two groups, 503A, that are traditional compounding pharmacies, like my store, like 99% of the stores you see, and then 503B, which are called outsourcing facilities. Now, if you've ever ordered a Myers cocktail, if you've ever ordered a, um, you know, anything that you want to use for your clinic, but your patient is not identified ahead of time, in other words, it is for office use, those are compounded only by 503B compounding pharmacies. That's an important thing. However, the 503B compounding pharmacies are also subject to all the rules, regulations, and laws as defined in Code of Federal Regulation, CFR, that is concerned with current good manufacturing practices. Because now they're considered manufacturers, traditional compounders like I, and like 99% of, of compounding pharmacies are uh, not involved in those activities. So there are things that we cannot compound because of those rules, and there are things that we can compound. And if you ever have a need, you pick up the phone, call your pharmacist, and they'll be happy to help you um, navigate that landscape. There are other regulating bodies that regulate compounding pharmacies either directly or indirectly, DEA, OSHA, uh, county health agency, and there's more. And when something happens, they all show up and um, and pay you a visit. Well, what are some benefits of compounding? Well, compounding offers you flexibility in prescribing. And you can literally prescribe anything within your scope of practice that can be compounded and your patient will get it. Imagine the possibilities with that. 
imagine exact dosing, no more underdosing or overdosing of your patient because something is not available. For instance, you no longer have to, if you have a, a hypothyroid patient you, and that patient is a good candidate for compounded thyroid medication, you can, you no longer have to do um, one dose on odd days and a different dose on even days so that cumulatively over a period of time you get a certain amount and the serum concentration of that patient will have peaks and troughs because of the dosing. You don't have to do any of that. Also minimizing side effects to the patient. Uh, having flexible doses forms ability to titrate as tolerated. For instance, you want to initiate somebody on low dose naltrexone. Or you can um, fine tune it. You can start at even 0.25 milligram, 0.1 milligram. I had a prescription the other day for a 0.25 milligram of ketotifen oral capsules that is not available anywhere. And then we can go up or down depending on how you and, and the patient are um, are traveling on that path of titration for the effects that you intend. Also, different medications can can be combined in a single dose. That's, of course, when the chemistry of the medication allows. A really good example of that is mixing hormones. For example, your biestrogen hormone and testosterone and progesterone can be mixed into a cream. And then you do a couple of clicks on a clicker. Right now, you're having four different hormones delivered at the same time over a very small amount of skin. And it often comes at cost savings to the patient. Although just the beauty and the power of knowing that you can prescribe for every one of your patients exactly what you have in mind. It's not a situation that, well, they don't make this, or it only comes in these three doses and good luck getting everything else higher or lower. This is really important because if you're hearing this presentation, you probably are the person who people come to because they didn't get the answers they, uh, they wanted elsewhere. So it's important to have this tool in your toolbox. What is the source of information? How do you know what to do? Well, United States Pharmacopeia or USP uh, puts out guidelines, and you've got these guidelines are adopted by State Board of Pharmacy and even the FDA, and they become law, rules, and regulations, depending on the category. Um, there are different chapters that are concerned with different types of activities. Chapter 797 is the one that sends the guidelines for non-sterile compounds, which is something I think most people on this presentation do. Chapter 797 is concerned with sterile preparations, and Chapter 800 is uh, concerned with worker safety. Chapter 795, um, in very details, explains the grade of materials to be used. For instance, national formulary, USB grade, and so forth. It talks about potency testing of the finished products. It assigns beyond use dating, not to be confused with expiration date. But, but that's where we get the information of what the maximum number of days is on a particular compound. How to do record keeping, quality control, and that sort of useful information. The USP 800 is another chapter. It has been implemented in some states, and North Carolina for the pharmacy has also adopted it. It has not been implemented yet here because of a technicality, but it will come um, sooner rather than later. Um, chapter 800 is concerned only with worker safety. It, there's nothing in it for the pharmacist, or patient or the physician. It's only with the person who actually compounds the medication. So um, it talks about having very, very strict engineering and environmental controlling uh, parameters set in, as in really working in a clean room. And the air inside of that clean room must be changed completely once every five minutes while it's maintaining a certain relative humidity and temperature. And for those of us who live in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida area, we know that over the months of summer, the air conditioning must work so hard to maintain this. It's much like um, traveling your car down the highway with the windows open and expecting the air conditioning to, uh, to do the job and keep you cool. Anyways, that all translates into an added operations cost that unfortunately will have to be transferred 
to the patient ultimately as consumers we also always pay for additional costs but it's coming and more information on that is available so what medications can be compounded of course based on a valid prescription from a licensed prescriber a medication can be compounded for a patient as long as uh, it does not uh, copy a commercially available medicine for instance progesterone oral capsules are available in brand and generic in 100 and 200 milligrams they're filled in uh, peanut oil they cannot be compounded the changing the format um, doesn't qualify them to be compounded unless the patient has allergies to say um, uh, peanuts or peanut oil or to dye the red number five whatever dye is in that comp in that uh, available medication unless uh, in those cases um, if we compound these we, we are stepping out of uh, the compliance realm uh, compounded medications are also not um, available for resale and the board is very strict on that in North Carolina in other words they don't want the prescriber to benefit in any uh, way form or shape from prescribing compounded medications and this is very much in line with federal statutes of, of, uh, of the same about 12 years ago or so accreditation became a hot topic of discussion for compounding pharmacies. Um, pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board was established. It used to be a nonprofit organization, just uh, colleagues checking colleagues based on defined reasonable standards. So things have, have changed since then. There are other compounding bodies, they're really businesses now more than anything else and they do have sets of regulations. Some of their standards do make sense. Some of the standards absolutely make no sense for a small compound and pharmacy. They're really written for large hospitals and, and chains. Uh, be that as it may, these are the companies and then that's the function that they perform. Quality is a very important piece of what we do and there are standards for it set forth by USB Chapter 795 and other sources. So all um, personnel involved anywhere in the process of, of compounding must be trained. They must know how to use things properly. And that's not just a one-time thing, but it's an ongoing um, based on certain intervals for different things. Even the equipment that they may not use um, uh, regularly. How you document your things, your standard operating procedures. This right here takes the person out of the pharmacy. It implements a system-wide approach. Um, in terms of analytical testing, how do you know that, for example, progesterone 250 milligram capsule that you compounded is really 250 milligrams? Well, we send them out to be tested and different certifications that are involved in that. Also, having a computer system where you can track every lot to every patient or start from the patient and track back to see what was used. Those are all available and useful things that we use and they must exist. Um, what sorts of active ingredients and excipients and delivery vehicles do we use? We use everything that is, um, pharm that is pharmaceutical grade or better, meaning United States Pharmacopeia or National um, Formulary or the other grade materials that we talked about in previous slides. Excipients are also hypoallergenic, very clean. Everything that we use does come with a certificate, certificate of analysis and material safety sheets. So we can study them and see exactly what's in them, uh, make sure they meet the criteria. Also, the delivery vehicles that we have now are, are very advanced. We're using different topical systems. They're very easy for the end user, the patient to use. They meet USB criteria for container. No more um, you apply a dab or put a teaspoonful on yourself. None of that. Everything is very calibrated. And we make sure that the dose that you intend is what the patient seeks. There's virtually no limitation in what form of compound medication we can send for potency testing or for other types of testing. It can be whether um, a, a trochee, a tablet tritura, a suppository, um, an oral medication form. We can do it all.
some dosage forms available are creams and ointments of course lollipops do really well for numbing the um, area um, deep in the in the mouth or throat or right around epiglottis uh, rapid dissolve tablets effervescent powder so there's a lot of things available to help deliver the medication to that patient in any uh, form that we possibly can Um, here is the picture of a trochee. We have this one red for a uh, better depiction on the picture. We put a um, uh, red dye in it. They can be in gelatin or in um, other types that are, that are non-allergenic. They hold a um, certain amount of medicine. You can put up to 200 milligrams of progesterone in one of these trochees. They're like soft candy, can be used either sublingually or uh, through the buffalo wrap. And this is a picture of rectal rocket. We compound these for hemorrhoids or people with you know issues in the rectal area. They can be medicated with agents such as hydrocortisone, promoxine, lidocaine, and maybe even the thiazem or nifedipine, depending on on the um, application. They work really well, but um, they're really creative. And here's a a study that was done on progesterone 5% or 50 milligrams per mil. Um, the sponsor of the study is Humco. They, of course, they make uh, several bases that carry these molecules across the skin. And um, there are several different bases available in the market now. There's a lot of good bases in the market, so I don't think really any one company has a monopoly over my base is the best. This is a picture of uh, a chromatogram. This is the actual picture of the test that they provided. We can calculate area under the curve. We can look and see, make sure that there are no interferences with the analysis. A good robust analysis should look like this on a chromatogram. Uh, being a chemist and going to pharmacy school, I have a soft spot for this type of information. The graph below shows the uh, results of the study. It's uh, important to note that this is only over a 12 hour period well a lot of the absorption is really going to happen you know between right before the 12 hour period when somebody applies something to their skin if we're looking for transdermal effects on the right hand side names of the bases are depicted um, these are commercial bases and they're all good bases however um, i still see prescriptions coming in where the physician just habitually says Compound this in Versa base or compound it in X, Y, and Z. But having information like this, we can circle back to the physician and say, hey, this base perhaps performs better for these purposes. What do you think? Now, there's again a lot of good bases out there, and it's really hard to buy a bad base. And here's more um, the rating that the company has put out. Here's a bar graph. Um, a depiction of the information we saw and it shows that both the um, HRT botanical and um, HRT heavy and um, pancreas do really well. Actually it's hard to find a bad base in here for progesterone that 5% is 50 milligrams per mil. That brings my presentation to a conclusion. We covered a lot of stuff and there's a lot more to talk about <laughs> at another time. If you have any questions or if you would like any additional information, here's my contact information. Please feel free to call me. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your presentations.